thank you for being here. I hope this can be of value to you. I want to give you just a little bit of some familiarity with the tool that we're going to be using today. So this is what your screen probably looks like. Something very similar to this, or maybe it's got the, maybe you have chosen the, the um, gallery view so that you can see everybody who's on the call. But the bottom tray is what I want you to focus on. So these are some of the most important buttons, okay? The first button is the mute button. You've all done a great job with that. Please mute yourself. The second one is please show your camera. Social isolation is bad for you. And there's a polling button. Um, we're gonna do a couple of polls today. Um, some of this is for me to test this because I think this is gonna be the new normal for us. And then finally, that chat button. Um, so again, please mute yourself. Please turn your camera on so that we can see you. Buckle up, we're gonna do some polling and use this chat button. We're gonna talk with our fingers today just because we've got over 100 people uh, on the call. So um, thank you, let's buckle up. Here is uh, my first poll. How anxious are you? And here is the poll, I'm gonna launch it. So on a scale of zero, no anxiety, I am like rocking out to 10, I could buckle at any moment. Where are you? So um, I admit if you're calling in, you're not gonna be able to see this poll. It's best if you are using a desktop or a laptop system so that you can enjoy all of the functionality, but I do promise to report out to you. So the poll is open. Um, on a scale of one to 10, what's your level of anxiety right now? Just click on the number that makes sense for you. So um, one is I have no anxiety. 10 is I have got a ton of anxiety. Um, I see you guys are lighting it up in the chat function. I'm wondering can't if you see can, the poll. there we go. Can you see it now, Dennis? I just moved it over onto the main screen. Still no. Well, three of you have voted. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll, you know what? I'm flexible. I can look at the chat as well. Um, if you're not able to see this poll, A, my test is failing. And uh, if you can't see the poll, go ahead and put it in the chat of where you're at on a scale of one, no anxiety at all, to 10, I could buckle at any darn moment. Hmm. Okay, lots of threes and sixes. Definitely the median is seven and under. You guys are lighting it up. Someone in here, Kelly, I want to talk to you. Kelly's at an eight. She's killing it right now. Oh no, she's, she's nearly at, at capacity. Sorry, I got my one through 10 messed around. Um, okay, so pretty good distribution. Um, Probably, yep, for those of you who are not able to see the poll, go ahead and just put your answer. One, no anxiety. 10, I could buckle at any moment in the chat so that we can see where you are. Uh, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly says, I have no camera to see you, so you cannot see my anxiety. I love you, girl. I'm sending you a big hug right now, a big hug. Um, fantastic. Okay, so um, thank you for responding to the poll. Uh, Joe said, I saw a 10 in there. I saw it too. I saw it too. Uh, this is helpful for me to know because my overall goal in this is to help bring some of the anxiety down by giving you some tools that will help you think more strategically, more clearly about the future. So here's the chat um, that I'd like you to, again, go over to your chat box. And what sector are you in? I know that we've got nonprofit. I think we've got some local government. We've got chambers and economic developers. What sector are you in? Man, you guys have this chat down. Everything from university, small business, tourism, man. Tourism, I'm giving you guys a big kiss right now. <laughs> At the moment, cybersecurity, public university, chamber, local government, nonprofit. I work in all sectors. I appreciate that. Um, I think I know who that's from. Local government, civic engagement, local government. All right, good, good, good. Fair enough. Okay, so 
we've got this this about follows the sweep of the sectors that we work in most often. Um, I encourage you to, if we're not hitting on something that's kind of in your wheelhouse, please feel free to put it in the chat box because we do have time for some Q&A. So, um, and I'll, I'll check back to that, uh, ch that chat box from time to time. So today I've got just a, a few things I wanna cover with you. Um, the first thing is I want us to bubble up and take a, a sort of a foresight lesson on what these pandemics really teach us. It'll help you wrap your head around certainty and impact um, for the future. The second thing though, and this is the main event, is all right, how do we do scenario planning? And we're gonna use the zones, uh, the three scenario zones from the Institute for Alternative Futures. And we have one of the, the authors and major contributors to that on the call, uh, Jonathan Peck. We also have one of uh, the futurists who worked at IAF for many years, Yasmin Arakan on the call. Um, and they're gonna be available to help us think through any questions we have. We've got a couple of other professional futurists on the call who are also gonna avail themselves to our questions. So um, you've got a heck of a panel that's come together here to help us all think through this. Uh, you're not alone. And then finally, we will do some Q&A as time allows. And I want you to know there's a hard stop at the top of the next hour but I've asked people to hang out, our panelists to hang out for a little bit afterwards as they can. Um, the goal is to help as many people as possible. All right, so what do pandemics teach us? First thing is this notion of fire marshal versus firefighter, right? We are definitely in the US right now in firefighting mode. Um, but when you think about what a fire marshal does in a, in a local community, right, the fire marshal goes in in advance and inspects things and so forth. One of my colleagues at the CDC, it's now become news, but one of my colleagues at the CDC, I was with her at the end of January when this outbreak was just starting. Um, she suggested it would become a pandemic and she also said that the CDC used to have or be participating in a global health advisory panel whose job it was to be the fire marshal on things like this, to get out ahead of things like this, um, but it had been defunded. And I find so often that things like, um, kind of like how you don't get security cameras until after the burglar like breaks into your house, uh, very similar in a moment like this, where we don't recognize how important the fire marshal is until we've got to dispatch the fire the firefighters. So as we move forward with our planning, I hope we can always do a little bit of a budget set aside or um, you know, some subscriptions for folks who do wake up thinking about the future you know, on our behalf. I hope that it's a, it's a good lesson learned and one that we can apply within our own organizations. We also learned about black swans, right? Those are those events that nobody sees coming, but in hindsight, you look over your shoulder, you're like, we probably should have known that was coming. On Sunday, I did a, a Google search for um, pandemic preparation or pandemic scenarios. And the first video that popped up was one created in 2018 by the CDC talking about how they were ready for a pandemic. And, um, you know, watching it on Sunday uh, felt a little silly because as we, they kind of went through their list of all the ways that they were ready to respond, it was clear that all of those responses hadn't taken place yet for whatever reason. So, um, you know, that notion of we know it's coming, uh, can we be ready? The other thing that this shows, and I think this is difficult for some countries like America, whose primary myth is rugged individualism and pulling ourselves up individually by our bootstraps, is this notion that we really are interconnected. Um, so the, you know, this, the flattening of the curve relies on personal responsibility for a greater good. And I think for all of us who work in local government, we can really feel into this, right? That idea that uh, local governments work on behalf of the commons, on behalf of the public good, but often that relies on people doing their part, you know, whether it's paying taxes or social distancing. So this is reminding us of our interconnectivity. Uh, and then finally, the systems that we set up for normal times just are no match for big disruptions. And so our ability to flex and, and pause and think critically and what, what, what else is required is really fundamental. 
Uh, but there's a, mitch, a mismatch, right? Because the anxiety that we feel causes poor decision making, right? I mean, that's what we know from the science is that anxiety causes uh, poor decision making. And therefore, when we're anxious, when we're fearful, it's difficult for us to act wisely. It's difficult for us to imagine or invent what those alternative systems could look like, which is why doing dress rehearsals for the future is so important. So just to put the black swans into um, context, right? There are those high certainty, high impact things that we absolutely know are going to happen. We know we're going to die eventually. We know that we're going to, we are, and we'll continue to get hit by cyber attacks. We know about election meddling. We're preparing for extreme weather events. Like these are becoming more frequent, right? So these are those high impact, high certainty. I call this between us, I call this oh shit corner, right? We know these things are going to happen and we know they're going to have a high impact. And then as you go around kind of the, the four box here, seasonal changes are things that we know are gonna happen, but they don't have as much impact because we're ready for them. So we're certain they're gonna happen, but you know, when the first snow falls in October in the upper Midwest, is it a surprise? A little bit. Can we deal? Absolutely, right? Then you come over into kind of who cares corner. These things we don't know are gonna happen, whether they'll happen or not, they're uncertain and they're very low impact. And then we get into the black swan corner, right? These are low certainty. We are not sure if they're gonna happen, but they will rock our world. Pandemics, electromagnetic flares, these are the kinds of things that have um, you know, low certainty, but really, really, really big impact. So just to put this pandemic in perspective, you know, most people focus on the upper right hand quadrant, things that they know are going to happen and they know are going to be high impact, right? These things in the upper left hand quadrant are things that, you know, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but whew, we're on our back leg when they happen. So I want to share with you some ideas for how we can apply foresight to COVID-19. Now, just to zoom out, You've, many of you have seen this, right? This is the six step foresight process. And if everything was great, we would start at step one and we would proceed merrily around the framework, right? Well, this is an unusual time. We're jumping right to forecasting scenarios, which is step 3A. And we are gonna be talking today about plausible scenarios. And while we're gonna be talking generally about scenarios, I invite you to think about how you can apply these questions and these tools to your domain, the people you have to take care of, whether that's at work or in your community. Um, also encourage you, if you're not participating with others today, which many of us aren't because we've been asked to work at home if we can, um, these are the kinds of things you can take back to your group and do some critical thinking together about these scenarios. Okay, so what exactly are scenarios? At, at its simplest, a scenario is a story. It's a, a story about what could happen in the future. So it, scenarios allow us to imagine. Um, you know, if you think about, um, I saw a, a book recently on the future of warfare, a series of different stories about what war warfare could look like. Um, my friend Ari Popper and some of his colleagues have written a story about the future of cities, imagining, you know, a lot of cities underwater as one example, imagining a series of different things about cities. So these are stories about the future. For those of you who are total science fiction nerds, um, you know that those are examples of stories about the future, some plausible, some not, but those are scenarios, stories about the future. And what's valuable about, about scenarios is that they, they're, they're a tool that helps us rehearse the future. And in this moment, in this moment right now, where a lot of people are feeling anxious, locked in place, a bit stuck, it, puts a little more oxygen in the room to say, all right, let's start thinking six months down the road, eight months, nine months, 18 months down the road. Let's think critically about what may happen 
and what our response should be. And this gets into why scenarios are so useful. The first reason that scenarios are so useful is it allows you to test your current strategies against these possible futures. I was just exchanging emails not an hour ago with um, somebody at a chamber of commerce uh, in, in Texas. And he said, Rebecca, the chamber model, this is gonna be the true test of the chamber model. And if we don't transform, chambers will not exist in the future. So we might have great strategies as a chamber on how to engage members, but do those strategies still work in an environment where people are sheltering in place, working from home and so forth, right? So scenarios number one, help you test your current strategies. The second thing they do is they en enable you to start thinking about new or updated strategies. Okay, well, if, the, if X doesn't work, what's a Y that we could pilot or we could test? What's a Z that we could think about rolling out? So I know in my world, I got an email over the weekend from one of the biggest speakers bureaus and they were asking, does anybody know how to do remote presentations? Are you available to do remote keynotes? We've got clients who still wanna have meetings, but we need to rethink the whole thing. So they're updating their strategy for how to um, kind of meet their clients where they're at. And from a deeper perspective, I think to honor that people still wanna meet, people still wanna to be together. And then the, the, final, the final two reasons that I find scenarios extremely useful is they enable wisdom. You know, I, I just, it's not wise to just keep barreling ahead with the strategy that you really like um, in, a, in a time of greater uncertainty or greater anxiety. So one of the things that scenarios do is they enable you to take wise action that is sensitive to the moment, right? Wise action that is sensitive to the moment so that you can help be an actor in the future you want, right? The other thing on the flip side of that is that they prevent sort of poor me thinking. And this is some of what I'm seeing, right? People who say, well, there's nothing I can do. We just have to let this run its course or worse. I'm gonna wait for someone else to figure this out. Uh, Cause you know, it's just poor little old me. There are absolutely things that we can do. And, and let me just say that humanity is amazing. You know, when humanity has been on its back leg, it has figured out a way to innovate, to be flexible, to come out and through. And <laughs> I am betting on humanity. We're not going to see the best of everybody in the coming days and weeks and months, but we can start to make that choice for ourselves, right? So um, I don't believe that the future just happens to us. We also help shape the future, and that's one of the beautiful things that scenarios can help us do. So I'm gonna start by asking you about assumptions. So in a moment, we're gonna talk about three zones of scenarios. And as we do that, it's going to be useful for us to start with what we know. Think of it as two columns. In fact, if you want to at home, get your Sharpie, get your pad of paper. What do we know? What don't we know? Let's start with just a simple two column approach with our assumptions. So I started this for us, but let's get on the chat and let's talk about what we know. Okay. So one of the things that we know is that we are in a pandemic. WHO has said it, right? And we also know the general shape of the curve under different scenarios. So we know this is a pandemic. We know the shape of the curve. And just knowing that can help us know when we hit a tripwire into a possible new reality, right? So uh, when President Trump, for example, announced the two-week timeline, Right? I think I'm guessing that that's probably in part to see what happens to the curve to know if we have tripped into a new reality or, or not. Um, so th well, that's one of the things we know. We also know that the pandemic is, will be linked to an economic recession. We're already seeing big layoffs in tourism and hospitality. Um, as a, many, many, many hourly workers just full scale being laid off. Right? We know that fear can impair decision-making, right? It's 
So then how do we take responsibility for being as fearless as we can be, right? Um, we also know that generally there's a flow to how people deal with this kind of stuff. So it starts with denial. Well, this isn't going to impact me, right? So if you've heard about, you know, young people who are continuing to go out to bars and restaurants because they feel like I'm not going to get it or if I get it, it's not going to be a big deal, right? That's the denial, right, that you see. Whereas other people who are in high risk groups did not have that feeling uh, at the outset. They maybe felt a bit more worried. Right? So you go from denial then into fear, like, oh crap, right? And then you, then you slowly kind of cross the curve. I read yesterday that it took about two weeks for people in China to kind of like, all right, this is the new normal. You know, like we're gonna settle into what this is. Again, people are incredibly adaptive and they can be incredibly resilient. And then uh, appreciation, not everybody gets there. Uh, but some people are. I've heard some people talking about like, okay, this gives me time to catch up on a reading that I wanted to do or to, you know, investigate some other things. So those are some of the things that we know. We also know that, I don't know why this just stopped, but that isolation is, it, it can have a negative impact on people's health. So as people are isolating, um, that there's, that's another public health concern is what that does for people's health. So let's get in the chat. I want to hear from you. What else do we know? What else do we know, know at this point? What else do we know? Yes, businesses can be very innovative. We know that most people will not die. They're not lethal. We know that travel is going to be impeded for a while. We know that there will be big economic and job impacts. We know what worked and didn't in Italy and China. That's right. Um, <laughs> we don't know what we don't know. So we don't know what will change for forever because we don't yet have the benefit of hindsight. That's right. We know that people are resilient. Uh, we know that this will change how we do business. We know that home is nice. Yes, we do know that people are frightened. Uh, people are looking for leadership. Um, yes, we know what worked in South Korea about being proactive, the impact on seniors and children. You guys are, this is fantastic, right? This is critical to sort of what are those known knowns, right? This is where we start our scenarios. Um, we do know that some people still don't think this is real, that technology will increasingly play more significant roles. Um, we know that there's an X factor to the triple, uh, the triple, the trickle effect. Yes, Bob, that collaboration is going to be clutch key to getting through this. Um, Mayor Funk, we can watch what works or does not in other countries. Yeah, choosing that stuff makes a difference. It absolutely makes a difference. Uh, Greg Potter says, we know there's going to be a baby boom. Okay, sir. Uh, <laughs> We know that emissions are going down. That's right. Wuhan, seeing a blue sky for the first time in years. Um, brittle systems will fail. Um, whether that is, those are business systems or, or systems that just cannot hold up under this system. Um, oh my God, I love you guys. And a divorce boom, evidence from China. I love the jesters who have signed on. I love you guys. Um, yeah, we're going to find out how remote work works in a big way. Good, good. These are some of the things that we know. All right, so I'm going to come back to the other side of the equation. What don't we know? What don't we know? So here are some of the things that we don't know, and these have to be factored into your scenarios as well, right? How long will this take? I mean, some of it does depend, right, on our approach. You mentioned like we can see what has and hasn't worked in other countries, right? But we really don't know. So some of the insight now is saying we might need to have a rolling, um, sort of a rolling sheltering in place um, or you know, social distancing uh, set of requirements. So that's one thing that we don't know. Um, we don't know how deep this economic impact will go. I've, I'm keeping an eye on this every morning. I'm waking up looking for new projections on this. But if we know that it starts with travel, tourism, hospitality, right? 
and we can start to see the rolling impacts of that. Um, there's probably some good modeling that we can do. And for those of you in chamber land or economic development land, understanding right now your members' sectors. Um, and I was even, I was talking with Charlie, who's on our call today, about how to do some Delphi studies, some planning of where people think this is gonna end up, right? So we don't have to figure this out for others, we can figure this out with others by asking wise questions. The next thing we don't know is the secondary and tertiary sectors. So I think we can all agree that the first issue is healthcare, is public health, and that's having an impact on the economy, right? But if we don't get the public health stuff right, then the economy stuff is gonna be all over the board. So if we get the public health right, and there's still gonna be this primary economic effect, what's secondary, what's tertiary? We aren't completely sure about that in part because we don't know what the entire um, you know, federal and global response will be. So therefore we don't know how long of a tail this will have in the economy. We, as I said a moment ago, we don't know the impact of an economic bailout. So now back over to you. Let's chat it up. What else don't we know? What don't we know? Will COVID-19 drive massive systemic change? That's a very big question, my darling. Right, Bill, we don't know what governments are going to do, and we don't know if they're gonna do it together. Uh, I think that's another piece of it for me that is a big question mark for me. Uh, Jonathan Packer, I know, we don't know when baseball will start. The MLB has done such a great job of creating the apps where you can tune in real time. Um, we don't know what life is gonna be like. We don't know if basic services are under threat, like water, power, fuel, food. Um, I will just say, I think we have a, I think that the, uh, uh, how do I wanna say this? You know, in the military, there's a saying that when your opponent is down, you kick him in the face. And as we are crippled um, as a country in the United States and as other countries are crippled, our natural enemies, if they're able, will probably try to hurt us further. Um, I don't feel like that's an unknown. I actually feel like that's pretty plausible. Um, we don't know if physical contact will be possible. Groups less than 10, none. Um, we don't know when this will end, long-term impacts on humanity, right? Um, that's a really good point, <laughs> right? We don't know if this racism against the Chinese is gonna last, although I think we can take an approach personally around that. Um, mental health moving forward. Boy, that's a really good insight, Mark, um, because we know that our mental health systems have been unable to deal with the mental health issues we see in our schools, for example, already, our schools and communities already, and how will this uh, exacerbate that? Um, we don't know the impact on the 2020 election. Um, we don't know if people are gonna, if this is gonna result in new tribalism. I just saw somebody say that they're, they're reading something May I ask um, if there are resources that you find very reliable, um, please add those here. I'm gonna send out a list of those uh, to folks after the, after the webinar. We don't know if, uh, if obesity will be a thing, if people can't go to the gym, right? Are people getting out and about? Are they taking care of their health? I don't know if I'm infected. I don't have symptoms, but I might have it. I might not, how do I know? Um, and then the PTSD, those symptoms, how many businesses are gonna fail, if education is gonna improve after school is closed. I was so reassured to see the CEO of Zoom uh, make this available to education and to healthcare. In fact, when you logged on to Zoom today, you may have seen solutions for education, solutions for healthcare. Um, so boy, we are able to test whether this stuff is gonna work. Um, so, there are, there are a series of things that we don't know, and those need to factor into our uh, scenarios as well. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna create scenarios in three zones, okay? We're gonna create scenarios in three zones, and here they are. Um, the Institute for Alternative Futures, Jonathan Peck, whom you've seen on the chat, he and his colleague Clem Wiesold and Yasmin Arakan, they have designed this model and I wanna take it from the bottom and proceed up through the top, but we're gonna to practice together, right? Based on what we know, based on what we don't know, the zone of growing desperation, right? Now this is 
this is that zone where um, <laughs> if there are more dominoes that are going to fall, this is where those would fall. Now, with one caveat, it has to be plausible, right? It has to be plausible. So, uh, you know, I will say that I think at this point, the media and um, how we're talking about this with each other, it can easily get sucked down into the zone of growing desperation. Um, I think we all know if we're not at a 10 in anxiety, we know people who are and their thought funnels are funneling around this just zone of growing desperation. Uh, my brother-in-law uh, texted his wife, my sister last week and said, I see a guy at Gander Mountain who's like buying out all the ammunition, right? So there are clearly people who are in a zone of growing desperation, right? The second zone, and by the way, for all of these, let's take an 18 month time horizon. So if we play forward through September or October 1st, 2021, let's think about an 18 month time horizon. So what could be in that zone of growing desperation? I wanna explain the zone of conventional expectation. So for those of you who use scenarios in other parts of your work or your life, this is often called the business as usual scenario. So the, the assumption here is, if we kind of manage this like we've managed similar things, what is in that zone of conventional expectation? And we're already seeing some of that, right? Like we're seeing the Fed come out with its 2008 Great Recession playbook. Like here are the things we should do. Uh, we're seeing Congress act. We know that we're in a presidential election. So we know we might continue to see a lot of political posturing as those stakes start to feel high uh, going into the fall. So there are some things that we can expect along that middle band there in blue, the zone of conventional expectation. And then there's the zone of high aspiration. Um, I've heard Jonathan say like, if we had surprising success, what could that look like? What could that look like? So what I'm gonna ask us to do, again, we're gonna use the chat for this, is we're gonna start with the zone of growing desperation. And the question is, what's plausible? Plausible, okay? So <laughs> even if it's for comedic effect, let's stay out of zombie apocalypse, unless you really believe that that's plausible. But what feels plausible in the red zone over the next 18 months as people uh, feel less and less empowered, as people, maybe as their panic increases, as the numbers spike. What feels plausible in the red zone? Yes, housing displacement, and we already have a housing crisis. A lot of people die. The, the number I've seen is two million in the US. Um, extreme poverty, <laughs> as if those who are economically insecure needed another, uh, another dose of reality, right? Um, 1.7 million deaths currently if we do nothing. These are excellent examples. Um, not making any purchasing decisions, so government shuts down. Water could become scarce. Yes, if we have more attacks on our major systems, um, any of our food, water supplies could become scarce. Nonprofits could close because people aren't giving to nonprofits. And think about the secondary effect of that. That means we may be able to provide less to those who need more in this time. Um, people can't retire, right? Retirements are lost. So people stay in the workforce longer, um, which might horn out the, the millennials and uh, Gen Z who are just entering the workforce more interpersonal conflict. Yes, you could definitely see a sense when there's more tribalism. Um, hoarding behavior becomes even more exponential. Um, suspension of democracy, right? Uh, who needs an election at a time when we're in such crisis? Um, a global depression. Yep, just saw that Mike Marcus. Um, elections halted. Um, how did the Soviet Union collapse? Bill's asking, could that happen to the United States? Mass evictions and bankruptcy, fear frenzy consumes the majority, economic st stagnation, huge gains, martial law. Um, oh yeah, if there's, <laughs> Stuart, appreciate that. If there's lots of deaths, does that mean there's a casket shortage? Will our ventilator shortage just become a casket shortage? 
a funeral director shortage, um, people burying cash in their backyard if all this goes south. Okay, so now let's put a pin in this conversation. And this is to, for you now to think about the zone of growing desperation in your own domain. So what is, a, what is something that feels plausible over the next 18 months within your own sort of sphere of influence or the thing that you're most concerned about, whether that's your organization or your community? So apply the same question, but to your situation. My clients decide to cancel work to cancel our work. Our chamber loses almost all of our members, either because they go out of business or because they just are like, oh, chamber membership is a nice to have, not a need to have, see you later. Um, massive business closures. Um, <laughs> I close my cultural nonprofit because it's not seen as necessary. Uh, I'm guessing is what you mean there. Um, somebody says, Joe says, I've already lost all my work. Um, Kelly says business growth grinds to a halt, uh, cl clients close down or cancel services, airlines stop flying entirely, tourism doesn't resume, so DMOs close, okay? I don't get to visit my daughter who's 4,500 miles away. Um, Stuart, malware ransomware shuts down, cooling towers, my parents die, I'm with you, Jill, my mom is in hospice right now, and the thought of not being able to be close by and to have her die without her family around. That's very sobering to think about. Food scarcity. Um, okay, Tim, we're gonna get to you about small town businesses making a comeback. Um, elected officials don't step up. That's a real plausibility. Um, family members at risk of death, yeah. These are all excellent and I didn't share that about my mom as a, um, I'm not trying to get anybody's sympathy. She's been in hospice for three years, which just shows how German and stubborn she is. But still, you know, during this moment, we've been preparing for this for a long time, but during this moment, it, it takes on a special potency. Okay, so that is the plausibility zone over the next 18 months. This is a great question to talk about with your own work group. What could this zone of growing desperation look like? Make sure it's plausible, make sure it's relevant, right? Let's talk about the blue zone for a second, okay? I want you to really think about, um, oh, I couldn't, I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> What's plausible over the next, in the red zone? Blue zone. Um, in the next 18 months in the blue zone. So. What does seem plausible based on how we've managed things in the past, based on how people are already stepping up, what feels like the 18 month expectable future? How could it look? Let's chat it up here a little bit. The pandemic over 18 months, it does burn out. We eventually all get it or most of us get it. We develop immunity, right? Um, if people socially isolate, we can contain this. We will have a recession. People will continue to work remotely. Um, elected officials don't step up is another expectable uh, future. Individual results may vary uh, based on location. Yeah, this technology is going to become a way of life. I think that that is an expectable 18 month um, scenario. Kids will go back to school. Uh, Holly says more women are gonna run for office. Mark says uh, we could have a deeper recession than normal because, uh, and the social safety net gets expanded, right? Uh, again, thinking about this from the lens of uh, re-election time, you know, how is government going to want to, you know, make sure that they're dealing with people's outrage and anger? Um, slowdown of small business startup. Yeah, we could see fewer startups. Um, some friends will get sick. And, and then how do we take care of them without human contact? Uh, Amy Pedretti, thank you. Big tech is gonna start taking action even faster than government. I, I have a feeling that we're already seeing this, where corporations can jump in and because of size and scale and solutions, they're able to help lead this, right? So the non-government actors really come forward in a meaningful way. Um, and how the community members and institutions step up to support each other, absolutely. Um, we learned that people and love are what's most important. Yeah, 
corporate bailouts, mandated shelter in place. Kids act like nothing happened. Um, that's one of the benefits of youth, isn't it? They don't know what's going on. Um, increase in inequality to, due to reduction of small business owners. Uh, we don't use data effectively. We're not gonna learn our lessons. We're gonna have very short memories, very reasonable, okay. Um, Linda, we figure out how to worship together while separate. Absolutely, this is already happening, right? Um, twice a day I'm with my, my Zen Dojo, morning and night. Um, we're figuring out how to be together while we're isolating. Um, now, here's what I, I want you to kind of feel into. So far we've done the zone of growing desperation. We've also talked about the conventional expectation. And doesn't the conventional expectation already feel a little bit more manageable, right? But we tend to, I mean, as two-leggeds, what our brains wanna do is take us to that zone of growing desperation. We have a natural inc inclination to worry that the future is gonna be terrible because the future is unknown. Right? So one of the, the hopes here is if, if you think about the future as like a dark room that you're kind of like walking into, trying to feel where the side is and where the top is, right? One of the things that a tool like this can do is help you turn the light on. All right, future, I see you. You're gonna come in one of three flavors, right? And we can imagine what those will be, think through those, and then be ready. So um, now, you know what, where this is going. It's time for the zone of high aspiration. And as my friends at IAF have taught, a good way to think about this, there are two prompts that might help you to think about this. One is, will we be surprisingly successful because of some top-down strategies? Or will we be successful because of some bottom-up strategies? So here, as you start to think about what's plausible in the gold zone, the zone of high aspiration, these are two prompts. What could happen from the top down? Or what could happen from the bottom up that would help this be surprisingly successful? So um, <laughs> large events will give way to small events. Farmers markets will be more popular. Small businesses are gonna proliferate. Um, yeah, those businesses that can see like where the opportunities are in times like this and how those can get up and going. Um, climate change mitigation, right? We're gonna just use less carbon and we're gonna feel the effects of that. Uh, a sense of community resurgence and how we can support each other. Bottom up, Dennis says, is entrepreneurial. Stuart said, silos could come down a little more. Um, so how can um, naval hospitals become part of the citizen health system? A very good local example. A top-down option might be that guaranteed basic income. I heard somebody say like, Yang had it right. Give everybody a check for $1,000 and now you're seeing that enter the national dialogue uh, through, our, through our commerce secretary. The, so as the global economies downshift, the local economies really have an opportunity to flourish. Um, more interactive travel, travel eventually that becomes more global, more cultural. Melanie says we're refresh, we could refresh our connections among people. Grace and kindness could prefer, prevail. There could be better social safety nets in the United States. I'm sorry to provide all this commentary, but in the same way that after Harvey Weinstein, uh, the accusations against him came out and the Me Too movement popped up across social media, I think it was really eye-opening for people to see, men and women alike, um, how many people were affected um, by sexual harassment, sexual assault. And I see the exact same thing happening right now where people are saying, I'm out of work. I do not have health insurance. The invisible is becoming visible. And that I think often helps, uh, you know, lead to some, if you want, from a social perspective, getting people getting woke about these issues um, and also having some sensitivity then around, okay, well, what does a responsible, you know, society look like that can be more responsive to that. Regional government authorities take root. I feel in a way like we're already seeing some of that. Some of the best responses have happened um, from super regions uh, working together, that cooperation. The new vaccine, I totally agree with you. 18 months time, if we have surprising success, that woman who got punched in the arm yesterday, she's, it's gonna show that it worked, right? Uh, maybe we will end up with a more global mindset. We will have a real understanding of how we're all connected. Faster movement to manufacturing 4.0 absolutely could happen. Joe, mandatory, paid, sick, leave. Linda, 
could families choose not to move a thousand miles away from each other? That sounds like a mom to her kids. That sounds like a personal issue, Linda. I'm totally kidding. Uh, but no, you're right. I mean, the, the idea that um, distance, we, you know, does actually create distance when the chips are down like they are right now in a pandemic. Um, community policing becomes the norm. Right, so <laughs> Linda says, guilty. Jonathan Packer just put, um, put a JPEG in the, in the chat if you wanna download it. I can vouch for him that he is safe to trust. He works in IT and uh, he's, he's, uh, he's, yeah. So Gordon asked, Rebecca, can you speak to the value of charting out all these zones and of thinking through desperation in particular? Yeah, so Gordon, the number one thing I would say on this is, um, first of all, I would do all the zones. I wouldn't just chart out growing desperation because the truth is any of these zones are plausible, right? It doesn't feel like it right now maybe, but any of these zones are plausible. But the zone of growing desperation can be useful for a couple of reasons. One is it makes you state your assumptions out loud to the group, right? You actually have to think through what are, what is in our zone of growing desperation? What are we putting in it? What are we not putting in it and why? So that you have a shared sense, kind of a shared set of agreements or definitions on the future that you're defining. So that's number one, but that applies to all the zones. But the zone of growing desperation, um, it's also valuable to think that through because again, what we're trying to do here is rehearse possible futures. You know, this is fire marshal stuff. We're trying to say, well, Growing desperation could happen, expectable future could happen, and high aspiration could happen. All of those are plausible in this, in this upper and lower limit of these zones. So by looking at your worst case scenario, it helps you um, be able to kind of preemptively think in advance and know where some of the tripwires are. And with that, I, I wanna talk a little bit about tripwires and then um, please light your questions up in the chat. So we can take a look at those in just a moment. But um, this is, oh, my apologies. This is an implications wheel. It's, a, it's an old tool. I think it goes back to the 1950s, but it's an oldie but a goodie, right? Kind of like that Beatles album that you can't shake. Um, and what this implications wheel does is it allows you to think through if an event happens, like an event that would be a real tipping point in your family, for example, right? So I'll give a personal example. We have a rainy day savings account. I know exactly how much money is in there. And if we need it, this is what it's for. But we also, uh, my wife and I are agreeing on what the threshold is, that when we hit that threshold, that, uh, that's an event, a tripwire, that sends us into plan B, right? So plan B is, okay, then what can we liquidate that could help us weather through another set of you know, months or years or whatever the case is. So that's what I'm getting at with, um, in any of these zones, you should also be asking, and what would be the tripwire that would tell us if we've tripped now into this zone of growing desperation, into this zone, this scenario, of the expectable future into this zone of high aspiration because those tripwires set off a series of implications and next actions. So um, let me give you a, a couple of examples. Like if you're at a chamber of commerce right now and you realize, I'm thinking about my friend Tim, who's in Orlando, right? A huge part of Orlando's economy is based around travel and tourism, right? So when they reach some sort of a threshold maybe of like eight weeks with the parks closed or 12 weeks with the parks closed, that board needs to be having a discussion about what the local response is. Whatever those tripwires are for them, like at what point does that set off like, okay, now we're really gonna need to come together as a community. How are we gonna organize around this to help support our community members getting, getting through these times, right? Same thing with your local and state governments. So um, there were many governments this year that were expecting a budget surplus. And they already had line items kind of set out for how they intended to invest or spend that budget surplus. Well, at what point will you know whether that's gonna happen or not? And what are the implications as a result? So going into any of these scenarios helps you trip into if X, 
then y. Okay, so if x, then y. Um, I want to I wanna take some questions in the time you have remaining. And as you're populating your questions here, I'm going to manage the questions. Jonathan Peck, Charlie Grantham, Yasmin Arakan, would you be prepared to take your phones off mute? Um, and Jonathan, I'd like to start with you. And I wonder if you might give a couple of um, framing comments around the usefulness of scenarios in a time like this. And then Charlie, we're gonna to come to you. Yaz, be on hold for the Q&A. Jonathan. Well, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, perfectly. Great. So the uh, two answers for me is, first of all, uh, to encourage creative uh, strategies and to be able to think what they say is out of the box. It's uh, where your circumstances that have defined your reality for uh, years and years are no longer the box you're in. And so you use scenarios to create some different spaces uh, where you're invited to think uh, in ways that you haven't, where your assumptions that uh, were previously constraining a strategy or let go and you come up with a new strategy. The second is that we had a uh, word that we uh, created uh, in a military health futures uh, that was pre-spots. Uh, and if you think about where we've seen the cost of slow responses, to new circumstances with this pandemic versus those who were very quick, who were prepared to respond. And so you can create a response mindset by having the different futures, the scenarios, the forecasts that alert you to change. And I think that uh, reduces the power of denial, which oftentimes is the barrier to actually uh, saying it's time to do something different. And so we've seen how that barrier kept people uh, working too long on old sets of assumptions and they didn't respond quickly enough and, and so the death rates have increased as a result. So I'm gonna stop with those two. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and it was Jonathan Packer, not Jonathan Peck, who added the JPEG to the chat. And Jonathan Packer is a trustworthy source. So if you want to open that JPEG, you're welcome to. Um, did you, Jonathan Peck, did you say these are called pre-spots? P-R-E-S-P-O-T-S? P-R-E-S-P-O-N-C-E. Pre-spots. Oh, right. versus response. I see. I see what you did there. Good. Charlie Grantham, comments, scenarios. Yes. We can hear you. Please go ahead, Charlie. Okay. I did one thing I just like to start off. It's a quote from somebody else who comes out of The Economist. It says, a crisis offers a chance to experiment with new ways of doing things, dash, and to question the wisdom of old habits. I'm an optimist and I think ultimately that's what's gonna happen this next 18 months. We're gonna to start to question a whole bunch of old habits and assumptions is we're all being driven to new behaviors and a lot of us are gonna do that and go, oh, wait a second, that wasn't so bad. Why didn't I do that before? So I'm, I'm kind of uh, in that mode. Um, I think your idea of uh, tripwires uh, it is extremely active. Everybody should be doing that at the individual and organizational level. I'm, I mean, you know me, I not only have plan B, but I have C, D, E, F, and G ready to go. And I've got a list on my wall here of triggers that I watch every day. Uh, I'm in plan C now and th things are okay. So I really like to get some questions from folks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Charlie. Um, first of all, yes, that you will have access to the recording. Um, I'm looking through ideas to effectively be ready for spring. Um, I have a feeling this might be related to my last book. I just do want to go on the record and say that um, 
I <laughs> sent a note out to all my Kickstarter backers and put it on my blog, but 2030 is the estimate for spring. And this was before this pandemic happened. Um, and, but I stand behind everything in that book about how to get ready for spring. Um, it starts at the, your very primary uh, close-in circle, right? Which is how, what new partnerships are required to build resilience and to build agility. Um, so if you're being asked to partner with somebody that you never thought you'd be asked to partner with, you're probably on your way. Right. So that notion of being able to think out of the box, as Jonathan said, or as Charlie said, to have this be a moment of experimentation. Um, I think that feels that feels real. And as I say that, I know that when we're afraid, it is difficult. It is difficult and even cognitively impossible to think about those things. Um, so this is going to sound so trite. Um, but one of my greatest wishes for each of you is to continue to breathe very deeply. There's a scientific reason for that, you know, I mean, so much science shows that if you can slow your exhale, it literally down regulates your parasympathetic system. You know, it's why people who do deep meditation can hit that period of samadhi where they feel like they are, you know, par part of all things. But even if you don't believe any of that, um, slow breathing helps you downregulate your system and to do that with your kids, to do that with your spouse, to take a moment at the beginning of a meeting like this, to just have everybody take one breath together to just downregulate your system um, so that you can be more mindful and, and uh, kind of de deescalate your own anxiety. Um, yes, yeah, so in Chinese, the word risk always comes with opportunities. So how do you take the, that this time and turn it around and turn it into an opportunity. Um, thanks for hosting. Tim says, looking for positive outcomes and working toward them are different things. We have to make our scenario outcome better. Man, if you guys agree with that, there's another webinar I wanna do around <laughs> causal layered analysis. And basically it says, if we want better outcomes, we need better stories. And I do feel like this is a moment when we have an opportunity to change the story a bit. Um, so if you'd like to see a free webinar like that, let me know in the chat or drop me an email. Um, I know the founder of CLA, so hi Anatoya, on Friday I believe is doing a webinar on that. So I'm happy to pass that along to you as well. Um, Sarah Bixby says, I've been using this crisis advice um, to other people as well. Um, ritualize your hand washing. Um, Charlie, does your level of concern or anxiety ramp up as you move from plan A to plan B to plan C? Oh, you, I, I just answered that. Somebody sent it to me privately, but oh. actually, actually it reduces uh, the, the concern and the fear because it gives me certainty that yes, I've planned and I know what to do. No matter what it is, I've got a contingency there. So I'm not really afraid that one of these tripwires is going to hit because I know what I'm going to do when it does. And uh, it might sound a little strange, but uh, that's, that's really how it works for me. I mean, I don't fear going from plan B to C because I know what I'm going to do. Right. And I've already thought through it uh, to a certain extent. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I want to wrap up um, by just giving one note, and this is um, out of so much appreciation for what you are all doing. You know, I look at the people who are on this, um, who are on this webinar, and I'm so humbled because you do such good and important work in the world, and you affect so many people. So um, some of you saw this on Sunday, the email newsletter that I sent out. But in, t in times like this, leaders have a responsibility to provide two things to people. One is a sense of perspective. And a way to do that is to remind people that we are creative and that we are innovative and that we will work together to give them a perspective. You know, we've been through shitty things before. Nobody has ever been through a pandemic before. I grant you that, right? But we've been through difficult things before and we can get through this together. That helps people get a sense of perspective. The other thing that people need is a sense of control, right? So what are the things that people can do? And um, this is where the fact that this, 
that this disease is invisible, right? That this virus is invisible. I think it gives it this kind of ninja-like quality that everyone's sort of looking over their shoulder like, shit, I don't know if I have it. If, I, if it's true that I can go 14 days without symptoms, do I have it? Am I passing it on to others? And the invisibility makes it kind of scary, right? But people do have some control. The first thing they have control over is themselves, right? And their own condition. So to help remind people that their wellness is important and that it can be just as good to not look at the news for half of a day or a day as to look at the news for half of a day or a day. If people really need to know something, they will find out. But staying in that thought loop of anxiety is not useful. Maybe to start every day with a quick all call online. How is everybody today? right? What's, what's everybody working on today? And to do that as a distant, at a distance. One of the uh, people who inspired me yesterday said, she's from Britain, everybody's working at home. She said, the first thing we did yesterday on our first all team meeting was we had everybody with kids at home, invite their kids onto the webinar, say hi, introduce themselves. There's no sense in denying that we're all working from home. Let's embrace it, right? So there are things that you as a leader can do to help give your people a sense of control. Um, and some of that is just making sure that we communicate in a proactive way on a reliable basis because reliability, communication, those are two things that help people um, have a sense of like being in the know on things and that helps give them a sense of control. So perspective, control, you got this and we're with you. We're with you. We are in this together. So Deep bow of thanks to Jonathan Peck, to Charlie Grantham, to Yasmin Arakan, and to the 137 of you who joined us. Um, we'll be back with more. Take care of yourselves and take care of others.